Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to the Pro Channel, where we analyze Hollywood in a way that they just cannot understand. We are here to give the journalists the main headlines for tomorrow. Joining us is LW Ghost yet again. And today we're talking about a big, big strike possibility that could yet again shut down Holly Weird. Lou, welcome back to the channel. Thank you, thank you. Yes, I'm sorry it's about such a difficult subject, but uh, these are these are difficult times we live in. What can I say? Yes, and it's about to get more difficult. Folks, let's take a look at this here out of Yahoo Movies. This by Casey Stephen, Gene Maddows, and Carolyn Giardina. And it looks like this originated from Variety. IATSE, also known as Yahtzee, and Teamsters warn of another's Hollywood strike at Massive Rally. Put your helmets on! Oh gosh, that sounds that sounds dire. Well, here's what it's all about. Hollywood union leaders warned of the possibility of another strike this summer if the studios cannot reach a deal before contracts or crew contracts expire on July 31st. Speaking to a rally of more than 2,000 crew members on Sunday at Woodley Park and Encino, Sean O'Brien, the president of the International Brotherhood of the Teamsters, said the unions should commit to withhold their labor and not grant an extension if a deal is not agreed by the deadline. This goes on to talk about the possibility of a real strike coming. And Lou, just like we have been reporting on this channel over and over, even before it was popular, but we did so because it was truthful and we believe in bringing people ahead of that culture curve. Look here where it says he also addressed one of the key issues in the negotiations, artificial intelligence, saying it should not be used to replace workers, but also it, that it has the potential to lighten the load. Lou, the, uh, this artificial intelligence deal, this text-to-video, you know, it's already got major studios out there canceling $100 million projects to expand what they can do because they look at it and say, well, I can do that. I don't need all these people. Yeah. What kind or, of a deal breaker or, or, is this? Or buildings or anything else. Look at, um, uh, uh, what's his name, Tyler Perry in Atlanta canceling an $800 million investment in his studio. That's right. So there's also an article, we'll read this in a moment, out of Breitbart that talks about the fact that there's like a recession hitting the uh, Hollywood, uh, what would you say, proximity, right? So entertainment can continues to be made, maybe not at the same clip it was before the pandemic, but entertainment continues to be churned out, spun out. It's just, it's happening in places like what you just said, Atlanta. It's happening in the United Kingdom. It's happening in, well, in the case of Superman, what was Superman Legacy, now Superman, Ohio. There is not a lot going on in Southern California relative to what was 20 years ago. Well, and you, so, have to, you have to remember the ripple effect through the fact that it affects not just the people working in the industry, but their dry cleaner and their dog walker and their local restaurant and everybody else, which may be part of the businesses that they work at when they don't have a job in Hollywood. So there's a triple whammy going on. So um, those talk to us, uh, I suppose. Well, first of all, you have to understand the history of this. And I know I've been over it before in bits and pieces, but let's try and do it in a concise manner. There yes. are basically three three-year contracts, although there's some within them, uh, that happen in Hollywood. One year, it's the Directors Guild. The next year, it's the writers and the actors, which we've just had. And the next year, it's the IA, which has two contracts, one for California and one for everywhere else, and the Teamsters. Uh, the idea of, of staggering them that way, of course, is so that the whole everybody doesn't quit all at once. Not that it really matters, because if you haven't got the IA, you're not shooting. And if you haven't got the directors, you're not shooting, etc. Right, one's enough. Right. But um, that means that the way these things work in the last several years is people do what's called early negotiations. And that is, we have 43 things we'd like to get, but we'll settle it down to arguing over six or eight of them if you'll come talk in March or April, rather than waiting until these things all expire on, on July 31st, because otherwise we're liable to be in the middle of something and have to shut down, and nobody wants that, because that really costs big bucks. So normally, if they're talking, they say, well, look, if we takes us an extra week over the deadline, you'll just sort of carry on with the current contract, right? And we'll give you the stuff retroactively, the whatever we finally work on. And usually everybody goes along with that. The IA has held up a big banner saying, it ain't happening this time, gang. And the reason they're doing that is that three years ago, and remember, all of these contracts, August 1st is the, is the date that the new one's supposed to start. So July 31st is the expiration. Last time, three years ago in 2021, they kept it going and kept it going and kept it going and kept the current contracts in force, extended them 
Uh, they finally made a deal in October for the contracts. <laughs> and they had, that was only after on October 4th, they voted to authorize the leadership to go on strike if they couldn't make a deal. That's not happening this time. They have said, no damn way are we extending this, and we are not interested in the current terms, because what they don't tell you is a lot of the members didn't like the terms last time. And the way the IA works, because it's 160-some-odd thousand people and has all these different locals, one for the editors and one for the cinematographers and one for the costume people and one for hair and one for... Anyway, they have what they call a delegate voting system, which is the rank-and-file votes... But then their delegates go to a group meeting and vote for them, and they don't have to follow the rank and file. And in fact, on that last contract, the rank and file in Hollywood rejected it, but the delegates voted for it anyway. So to say that there's been a pent up a uh, bit of anger going on is is to put it mildly and then you have to realize that this O'Brien guy from the Teamsters, this is the guy who just won the Teamsters action against uh, UPS. How big did they win? Well, guess what? At UPS, they're going to be making, by the end of their current contract, $42 an hour. You know how much uh, FedEx guys make? Uh, 26 27 That's a good point. So to, so to say that this guy is a hardball player who gets good deals one way or another by hook or by crook, that's why they're putting up all this anger and all this bluster, and they had this big meeting and this this rally with over 2,000 people. Uh, and the whole issue with AI that he mentions is about the work week and how many hours people work. There have been cases in the past where things shot and shot, and yeah, they were getting paid overtime, but people were killed in car crashes driving home because they were so exhausted. Uh, this is a real quality of life issue. And in the past, when various guilds, the Director's Guild, all, everybody tried to negotiate this, couldn't get much of anywhere about putting a limit on the day. So if they're saying, if AI is going to reduce some of the workload, well, by golly, we should get paid anyway and have a better life as far as not having all these hours away from our family and our home. So that's going to be the issue with AI is if it reduces the work, we should still get paid for what we do, and we should have to work less hours. So we'll see. And yet, and yet, some of this AI stuff seems to me to be an existential threat to many of the jobs that we're talking about. Oh, absolutely, it is, and that's why they're going to fight so hard now to get at least another three years of the deal they've got. Figuring at the end of that time, God only knows what they'll really need any of us for. Now, Lou, uh, you can't see this, but by the magic of the Pro Studios, the <laughs> audience out there has been watching a number of uh, photo images of people on strike passing before their eyes as they've been listening to this. And because so many people out there sometimes are hesitant to believe that AI is a threat or anything like that, folks, I just want to inform you that all of those photorealistic images were generated by artificial intelligence, and each one took about 30 seconds to create. Uh -huh. So that's an example of uh, what it is that, that Hollywood is facing. Now, Lou, we are getting ready for later today to host the town hall uh, as part of the pro show live. We're going to do the town hall uh, where Bob Iger is going to speak and, and answer questions. All of this seemingly to battle back against Tri-M. Uh, that's going to be at noon Eastern today. And uh, Bob Iger will go live at 1 p.m. We'll have live analysis and all of that. But Disney, of course, had, once upon a time, not so long ago, they were the top dog in the entertainment industry. They held that for about 15 years, I would say, maybe longer. But they're trying to get back on track with their company and draw audiences back to the box office. How much of a threat is this to Disney and to the rest of the entertainment companies if another strike hits in a subsequent year? If we have another uh, paralyzing strike in, in uh, August or October or whenever this might happen, what would it do to the industry? What would it do to the content creation? First of all, it would be August 1st. They would set it up so that if that day they haven't got a deal, bang, we're gone, we're out. So since we've just seen schedules for this new Mando thing at running through that date, there's a big one right there, isn't it? And the fact that they're doing it here, although remember, it's called the IA. The I stands for international. It's all across the USA and Canada. Uh, and, you know, to some degree, obviously, I've seen comments from people, oh, well, right to work states don't care. Yeah, maybe not. But if you want people to know what they're doing, uh, I, I can tell you from personal experience, having done a show uh, in London one time, nice people, 
talented, but oh, we're we're 12 hours away from air on a live international show. Tea time and everything <laughs> stops. Everything stops for two hours and we're going, in Hollywood, this would not happen. They'd get paid a little more, but we'd go through it because we're up against the deadline. It was a live show, an international live show, I might add. So it's a different world when you don't have, and the other thing is, remember, there's about 160, 165 people in the IA, a million, a thousand, pardon me, 165,000. They work. They work. When you hear 165,000 people in SAG and AFTRA aren't working because of a strike, uh, yeah, they're all working. They're all working at their real jobs because somewhere, when, at one time, several years ago, it was estimated that 2,500 of those people made 90% of the income. The other big factor you have to understand is how the pension and health plans work, because they're fighting for a lot for that in this. And the reason is the Directors Guild, the Writers Guild, the Actors Guild all work based on how much money did you make this year, whether you qualify or not to have the health plan and vest in the pension plan. Okay, you're all familiar, those of you who work for companies that have them, with pension plans. The IA has nothing to do with the dollar amount you made. So in other words, even if you're making three times scale because you're a hotshot cinematographer, it has to do with the number of hours you worked in a quarter and a year. Now, back when television series, back when I was making them, were going 23, 25, 26 episodes, and even before that, in the days when they were 30, if you got on a show and it lasted the season, you were 90% of the way there. You picked up a pilot or a couple of commercials and you made it. But now how long are the series running on streaming? Eight? Ten? Uh, even with reshoots and overshoots and overtime and everything else, you're not getting the hours. So a lot of these people saw their pension and health plans devastated by these two previous strikes. And a lot of them are going to say, you know what? Uh, it used to be I was really a grip, but then I did construction on the side. I think that's got to reverse itself. This is going to become my other job if I ever go back to it, if this happens. Well, let's get a grip on what's happening. Uh, there's an article out of Breitbart. It says production reduction, peak TV decline, spur blue collar recession in Hollywood. It yeah. says we're all looking for work. I, I want to give folks uh, a perspective about what this looks like right now on the ground. This by David Ng. Blue collar Hollywood crew members are reportedly struggling to find work as the end of quote unquote peak TV. Plus deep budget cuts across major studios have brought about a marked slowdown in production. The result has been economic devastation. For the so-called below-the-line people who keep Hollywood sets up and running, and by the way, folks, often they were on the margins, and that margin has moved. In a report from IndieWire, crew members revealed that some have been without a full-time job for more than a year, yeah. relying on day playing, the occasional music video, and we all know those are popular right now, not, or <laughs> odd jobs outside of film and TV. Many spoke of people leaving the industry altogether, of colleagues losing their health care coverage, as you were saying, and their savings. In one instance, one crew member spoke of self-deletion. Hollywood crews are represented mostly by IATSE and the Teamsters, which are responsible for protecting its members in their bargaining with the studios. Uh, it talks about the political endorsements. And this really gets into an area, Lou, that we don't often go on this channel, which is politics explicitly. But in this case, there is an explicit angle to this. It's going to have an impact. The politics of what's about to go down. Yeah, I, I have a theory. Walk us and through. I've, I've shared it with you. I have not seen anybody else out there say this out loud, although some may be thinking it, nor have I heard from anybody else. I want you to consider that this is an election year. And I want you to consider that Gavin Newsom and the Democrats who run California are in a bad way with the economy. And therefore, so is President Biden. And I want you to consider that there may be there, I think, almost certainly will be a, a come-to-Jesus moment, as they say, where they call in Iger, and they call in the people from all the other studios, and they say, look. And by they, you mean the top politicos. The, the political the people who they are on, already on buddies with anyway and make donations to, and they say, look, we can't afford the hit on the economy in an election year that this will cause. Make a deal. Give them whatever the hell they'll get by with. Which even means though, they have all the leverage, Lou. Even though you may hate giving it, and even right. what, the, and of course, <laughs> the other side of it is it's not your money, it's the stockholders' money. What do you care? So then, uh, so then the unions have all the leverage they're ever going to have. Oh, right they now. absolutely do. They yeah. absolutely do. And 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 yet, it could all go south, and everybody could go home. Uh, when I first began working in the business full time uh, out of uh, film school, 
I got a job as a grip through some friends at Universal. And I'd come on at night on a gang of five guys, and we'd go around moving things around and doing various things. And um, I talked to guys. I said, were you here because you wanted to be in the movies? Because I was excited. You know, this was my career. And, um, oh, no, I, this pays better than construction. So I was building houses, but now I'm doing this. Now I'm building okay. facades. Yeah, well, you know what? A lot of those guys are going to say it may pay less, but it pays regular. I'm out of here. Right. And you will yeah. lose not just – it's not just that these people will have to change their, their futures and their anticipations. You will lose this body of knowledge, experience, and talent that has built up over decades. It will go away. And all the AI and all the king's horses and king's men can't bring that back. Let me ask you another question. That's that's very poignant, by the way, and it should not be lost. The generational uh, uh, wisdom that could well, we've seen evaporate. it. We've seen it happen with the animators and Disney and that whole defile yeah, story, you, haven't you we? The, you can't get the genie back in the bottle. Exactly. But, Lou, let me ask you this. I don't know the answer to this one. How much are these individuals involved in the making of political ads? Oh, uh, yeah, sure, sure they are. Well, but well, the but what I'm uh, asking is, you could see a situation where. There's a desperation to, to craft political ads uh, in the latter part of this year, and this could have an impact. I don't know. If I, I think they'll do it just the way you did those images you did. Uh, that won't be because, you know. They'll find the workaround. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I don't think that'll be a pressure on it. I don't think it's, oh, gosh, we can't make ads. You guys got to make a deal. No, but we can't uh, raise taxes on incomes that don't exist. We cannot have all the businesses uh, I sent. Uh, our back chat, uh, an article today from the Wall Street Journal about all the restaurants and what they're going through with labor costs going crazy. Uh, you know, uh, California is about to go to $20 an hour for fast food workers. Uh, which, means, well, which means robots will fill those jobs. Which mean, Exactly. That's what it means. And it yeah. means it means that all these people who may work in all of these subsidiary industries or maybe their spouses do to fill in the gaps in the movie business. Um, they might be gone too. We talk all the time on this channel about how the theaters are dying. Well, when the theater across the way from it in the mall has a food court and that has two restaurants and the stores expect people to come an hour early to go looking through the latest merchandise and shop before they go to see the movie and there's no movie, what do all those people do? What Great happens point. to all those jobs and all of their expectations for a future, for a house, for a pension? I just, in this article I mentioned from the Wall Street Journal, they mentioned a woman who has a restaurant and how she got a small business loan. And she's so close to not breaking even ever that she's thinking of, of closing the place, but she can't. You know why? Her small business loan is guaranteed by her home. How would you like to be in that situation? I can't make any money. I'm dying. I'm people were doing things like if I can save 50 bucks this week, it's a better deal for me to go with a cheaper ketchup or a cheaper cleaning supply or whatever. $50, $50. That's how close to the line those people are. You throw this into the mix in California and especially in LA, uh, you're going to see people, you know, <laughs> Well, that's what we talked about on those margins. We don't, you know, we don't, the, we don't have as many moves. skyscrapers in LA as they did in New York in the great crash, but people are going to be jumping out of windows, gang. This is, They're, this is bad. And I've seen a lot of comments and a lot of threads, not just on our channels. Oh, the heck with them. Let Hollywood dry up and die. Who cares? Well, you know, it's not their fault. They didn't make the wokeness. They didn't, right. you know. <laughs> the cameraman they, doesn't have anything to do with it. Exactly. And by the way, by and large, remember, we're talking Teamsters and Grips. Those guys are pretty pretty conservative in their beliefs. Um, but they have to live in Los Angeles, which already is a detriment because the cost of living is so crazy and the cost of taxes are so crazy and the cost of transportation and fuel and everything is just crazy. So throw in, we didn't work for how many months during the last strike? And now... You don't want to give us a decent deal? Something's got to give. It will either be an absolute disaster or, as I believe, might happen. Might. The guys behind the scenes will come in and say, this can't happen, guys. Cut a deal. Make it happen. Right. And let's remember the people they're talking to, like Big Bob and his hippos, he's the guy that some could say extended that previous strike by those injudicious comments he made about, oh, these people we're negotiating with are unrealistic.
Yeah, yeah. I don't think he. I don't think he made friends with the nanny. He didn't make friends with the nanny, and he didn't make friends with the Warner Brothers and Paramount and everybody else because they said, "For God's sake, shut the hell up, up. Bob!" <laughs> Dang it, Bob! As we Dang say. Um, all right, Mike. All right. The spirit of Mike. So, is out so the- when you read these articles like that, when you put up with the Teamster guys talking about these these evil capitalist businessmen who run the studios, these criminal conspiracies, you know, he's just talking labor talk. He don't know better. But meanwhile. <laughs> <laughs> There's some reality going on here, and it ain't going to be pretty. Let's just put not, it that way. It's not lost on me, Lou, that uh, the markets which have been known for producing media are currently the markets that we see the largest exodus out of, and that's because of these conditions that you've been speaking to. It has an impact on entertainment. We're watching as entertainment goes to other locales around the continent, but uh, that still does not negate the importance of what's happening with these uh, union disputes and, and, the and I, I just of the on on the on behalf of my fellow uh, industry people, I entreat our viewers and our listeners uh, a little bit of compassion. These are people with wives and kids and dogs and cats and houses and mortgages just like you. Yeah, they happen to work in this business, but because you hate what the business is creating which you have every right to hate, and I agree with you, uh, doesn't mean we should say, well, you know, let them all burn. Otherwise, you're just the joker, you know? That's right. And, and <laughs> it is <laughs> unlikely. Some men just want to watch the world burn, you know? It is unlikely that the person uh, working on the audio master of your favorite content is somehow slipping in attacks against the patriarchy. That's e- Exactly. That the, right. Exactly. That's the role of the loudmouths, and the people behind the scenes seldom are that. Folks, if you would like to take a look also at uh, what we assess will be the box office run for Dune Part 2 and why I am not necessarily optimistic about it, even though I am rooting for it to do well, go over and check out our Patreon, which is www.patreon.com slash WDWPro for analysis that shows you exactly what might happen when it comes to the box office there and a very peculiar thing that's going on with Dune Part 2. If yeah. you like content like this, consider clicking the like button, share, subscribe, click it, stick it to the algorithms, it's the notification bell. Drop a comment down below. Let us know your thoughts. A mind is a terrible thing to waste, so waste not yours. <laughs> Join in with a dialogue that is the community you see here. Mr. Ghost, I'm looking forward to having you on in just a few to talk about Bob Iger and do the analysis of this Me town too. hall. Should, should be fun. And meanwhile, if you need an escape from all this, the genre guys just took one of the most underrated Disney classic animations and did it proud. And that should be going up, I guess, in the next day or so, too. Well, that's already up, folks. If you're a member of the channel, go check out the genre guys doing Hercules. You are going to think it's a Herculean effort of pure excellence. And go the distance. We have come to the end. We have gone the distance now. We must say goodbye. Au revoir. Adieu. Until we see you at noon Eastern time. Folks, wherever you are and whatever you're doing, keep learning, keep growing, and as always, keep having fun. Hey folks, it's a big week coming up this week. Tuesday at noon Eastern, the Pro Show is covering the Town Hall with Bob Iger, question and answer session live starting at noon Eastern. You do not want to miss it. Then on Thursday, don't miss out on That Park Place Live as they begin preview coverage of the Town Hall with Nelson Peltz. And with Jay Rasulo, former CFO of the Walt Disney Company, as well as the town hall that will be coming up with them. Questions and answers there for the Triangle Group. Then at noon Eastern, coverage to Valiant Renegade, where it will take place covering it live again. Don't miss a moment of it, folks. And don't forget Midnight's Edge also at noon Eastern, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We'll see you there.